Hello and welcome back, folks, English 450, uh, 550. Uh, this is chapter two of the book. We'll be talking here about interpersonal communication and emotional intelligence. And again, to set the stage, I've prepared a clip for you, uh, this time from not the show The Office, but the movie Office Space, which is uh, definitely one of my top five movies. I absolutely love it. I think you can and really enjoy this film, but also learn a lot about professional communication in the world of business. Yeah, even though it's a comedy, uh, it's probably not 100% accurate, but I think if you've worked in an office before, I think you'll recognize just how true a lot of this uh, uh, movie is. And of course, to get you know to be effective as a satire, uh, you have to know a little bit about how business is supposed to work. Uh, but anyway, before you uh, you watch this video, uh, this this lecture, uh, I want you to go watch that clip of the from the Office Space movie. Think about the people having this conversation. Uh, are they on the same level? Uh, do they are they emotionally connected, or are there just, there, does there seem to be some strange disconnect? Uh, as though they're almost from different planets, almost, it seems to me, as you, as you watch the clip. So just be thinking about that, uh, then come back, and then uh, answer my, uh, this question. Um, what can you learn about interpersonal communication and emotional in intelligence from this clip? Um, at what points do they seem uh, aligned, and where do they seem to be going askew uh, and things going all right? Uh, so ponder on that, uh, briefly answer the question, and then come back and we'll finish the, uh, the lecture. All right, here are the learning objectives for today. There's quite a few. Uh, so just keep in mind, since this, uh, you probably are aware of this already, but I don't expect you necessarily to sit through these in just one sitting, you know, especially a lecture that's over an hour long. So feel free at any point, you could pause this, uh, take a break, come back later. Uh, it should be fine. Um, I wouldn't be gone for too long, <laughs> and I don't know if it uh, what effects the software might have if you you know wait a whole day. But I'm pretty sure you can come back and if you want to take five ten minutes at any point, uh, just pause uh, and come back. Uh, anyway, let's look at these objectives here. So describe the interpersonal communication process and the barriers to effective communication. Explain how emotional hijacking can hinder effective interpersonal communication. And this one to me was, uh, this one's really key for me. I learned a lot from that myself. Uh, learning 2.3, uh, learning objective 2.3, how self-awareness impacts the communication process. So a little bit about mindfulness. Uh, thinking about self-management and how you can use self-management techniques and uh, to impact the communication process. Uh, one, another one of my favorite topics, explain and evaluate the process of active listening. Uh, so people tend to think of uh, listening as being a passive process. You know, you're just sitting back there, you're not doing anything. <laughs> you know, you should be uh, uh, like class participation, for example. <clears throat> to, to be a full participant in the class, you need to be talking uh, more than you're listening. At least that's what some people believe, but actually... <laughs> <laughs> you know, listening is hard work, too, and there's quite a bit of activity uh, that goes on with this listening. It's not like you're just listening, like you're just <laughs> back there zombified. There's actually quite a bit of uh, cognitive processes working. Uh, but anyway, I'm jumping ahead. You can tell I get kind of excited about these topics. <laughs> See, I love anything that kind of explodes uh, myths and, and what people take to be common sense, but then the science shows. Actually, it's the opposite. <laughs> All right, so uh, moving on, we got, uh, what is this, uh, five more to cover. Uh, describing and demonstrating effective questions uh, that will enhance those listening and learning uh, strategies. Uh, explaining strategies to cite, oh, this is another, yet another great topic. Uh, cite reading the nonverbal communications of others. So in other words, body language. And this is another one of those topics where everybody thinks they know everything there is to know about body language. And, you know, the, the, somebody's posture and eye movements, and they, they infer all kinds of uh, information from that, but turns out a lot of that is wrong. Uh, so we need to rethink our strategies for that. Uh, identifying common communication preferences based on motivational values. So you saw some of that in the office clip. Explaining how extra, extroversion and introversion, introversion impacts interpersonal communication. Uh, so you've probably heard of this about, uh, you know, some people are extroverted, they're kind of out there, they're, they're people people. Other people are introverted, you know, they prefer a screen or reading a book uh, to interaction. 
uh, interacting with people. Uh, so again, there's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of pop psychology around these topics. Uh, some of it's right, some of it's wrong. And then let's see, uh, last one, explaining the role of civility, civility in effective interpersonal communication and the common types of incivility uh, in the workplace. So this, again, the, even this last one here is absolutely vital. I mean, we, you know, it seems like every day, multiple times per day, we're seeing these examples of even the most highest ranking and expert professional. Uh, you th you'd think they would know better than this stuff, uh, but there, it's, it's, there's just countless examples of people uh, doing things and then later having to uh, apologize or even losing their jobs or at the very minimum, uh, a lot of respect and credibility uh, because they either don't understand or just don't care to be civil uh, in their interpersonal communication. So vital stuff. And here's the way this overview is going to break down or this lecture will break down. Uh, so it's pretty much, I think these are all the same as the, uh, mostly the same as the, the learning objectives. You can see a little bit more here about empathy, active listening, barriers to listening, asking questions, avoiding traps of empathy, and relationship management, uh, relationship management, communication preferences, and the impact of introverted and extroverted uh, participants, maintaining the civil communication. All right, so like I said, this is a pretty beefy lecture. All right, so table 2.1, we have skills that determine success. Let's see, where is this data compiled? I see nearly any poll of skills needed for career success. Employees identified interpersonal skills as the most important. So this is from a Gallup poll uh, of working adults. Uh, so that's a pretty reputable uh, polling agency. So I think we can generally hopefully trust these results but uh, look at the number one skill there uh, skills in dealing with people 87 uh, percent uh, so even though we are more online there's more uh, distance jobs still turns out you still need to have uh, people skills still uh, pretty vital you know 87 uh, percent let's see critical thinking skills another one <laughs> this is one your professors like to, to hammer on right are you just accepting things? Do you just want everything spelled out for you? Or are you able to step back and look at the bigger picture? Uh, basic use of computers, writing ability, basic math, uh, advanced use of computers, uh, physical strength, scientific knowledge, advanced math, artistic skill, and knowledge of history. So I'm kind of sad about this one. I mean, only 19 uh, percentage, 19 percent. Not sure how this math works here. <laughs> this is a lot more than 100 percent, but. <laughs> Uh, anyway, you can see there that there's apparently knowledge of history is low. But anyway, I always like to get your thoughts on these polls. So what do you think this poll is showing us or what we can take away from this poll? Does it surprise you? All right, so moving on then, uh, we have two tasks here. Or this, is, um, uh, this process is broken into two tasks. Uh, task one will be to overcome the barriers uh, to communication. And then the second one will be to manage emotions to engage in constructive communication because really nothing can derail a communication faster than uh, you know improper <laughs> emotional management people when people uh, we, we, we talk about people getting emotional uh, what we want to do is not think of that necessarily as a bad thing but just uh, there's ways to use there's ways uh, to manage emotions effectively and then there's ways to basically to be managed by our emotions uh, which is what we want to avoid all right, so we'll be talking here first about the uh, interpersonal communication process and a few terms or a few uh, definitions of it. You know, what is interpersonal communication? And it's just simply the process of sending, sending and receiving verbal and nonverbal messages between two or more people. And this last bit is why they call it interpersonal versus just personal. Uh, inter means uh, inter I-N-T-E-R means multiple units, uh, ex multiple external units, let's say, and intra with an R-A would be the opposite of that. But it also involves the exchange of simultaneous and mutual messages to share and negotiate meaning between those e involved. So again, quite a few little uh, terms in this definition that are important to notice. I like this idea of sharing 
and negotiating meaning. Uh, so you want to get away from this idea that, well, that means, th you know, th that you didn't get, <laughs> you didn't understand what I meant. You know, here is what I actually meant, uh, as though that's just for you to decide. Uh, the idea, though, is that a meaning is a shared process, right? We, what you mean is, uh, you might have thought you meant something, but uh, I have to interpret what you mean. And sort of between us, it's, it is kind of a negotiation to figure out what, <laughs> what exactly is the meaning of this. Uh, you, again, you hear this all the time. Someone will say, that's not what I meant. You know, you're, you're going off on a tangent or you're uh, deliberately uh, misinterpreting what I said and so on. And, and again, it's just people not either not properly sharing and negotiating. But here we have a handy dandy uh, diagram uh, with what looks like eggs to me. It's like some kind of eggs on a conveyor belt going around. <laughs> Maybe this is a ConAgra. No, this is a communication uh, process. And I always start over here. Communicator A is meaning, so you've got something that you, that you have in mind that you want to share. So you have to put that into words. Maybe. Or, you know, I guess it depends on the medium. Yeah, what they say here. So sometimes it's easier to just take out a, a quick sheet of paper, make a sketch of something, right? Uh, but anyway, you're putting it somehow into a message in a medium. Medium could be paper, uh, could be a conversation, could be a video, uh, whatever. It doesn't matter for this. It all works the same. It's all the same process. Okay, uh, so then someone else receives and then decodes that meaning. And maybe they, maybe it matches up with what you had in mind. Maybe it doesn't. It's never going to be 100%. Uh, we'll see there's all kinds of uh, noise uh, this, no matter how crystal clear you try to be, uh, there's always going to be other factors that, that weigh into this that sort of uh, distort uh, to some extent. You could you could look at it as distortion. I prefer to look at it as just communicator B's uh, creativity kicking in. I mean, communicator B is not a zombie. It's not a computer. Uh, this is a human being. Uh, so communication is never a one-way uh, process. It's always this cycle. Uh, anyway, they're going to be encoding and sending messages and mediums and receiving and decoding back to communicator A. And this will go around and around. And this seems like a fairly complicated diagram, but there's plenty that you can see where it's even more chaotic than this. Now, some people consider this even a naive, uh, overly simplistic view of this process. It really is just this <laughs> completely crazy uh, rhizomatic uh, process. And there's, it's just, you look at these... Uh, uh, philosophers, these linguists, and you wonder, how does anybody communi communicate anything at all? Maybe all maybe all communication is a delusion, and we're just fooling ourselves into thinking that anybody else gets uh, anything that we try to communicate. But uh, again, not very, that's fascinating from a philosophical perspective, but not really useful. <laughs> we're trying to uh, be, uh, be successful in a business. So uh, this diagram is, is fine. All right, so what does the word meaning mean? <laughs> how, how meta can you get, right? <clears throat> well, when we talk about meaning in a communication uh, course, we're talking about uh, the thoughts and the feelings that people intend to communicate to one another. Uh, so notice it's what they intend to communicate, not necessarily what they actually communicate, because remember that uh, other person plays a role in this. It doesn't matter how uh, crystal clear you try to be. They could take another meaning from it. Now, that's not that that person is dumb or stupid or, or whatever. It's not a negative thing. Um, it's really <laughs> it's kind of the recognition, hey, that, that's a person I'm talking to, uh, not a machine. Uh, so that's kind of the first step is uh, thinking about this as an intention, uh, not, a, um, you know, not a widget that you're handing to them. See, uh, <clears throat> other terms from this diagram, encoding. Uh, this is the process of converting the meaning into messages composed of words and nonverbal signals. So again, this is a, it's, it's a, if you take a course on language acquisition, which we offer here at St. Cloud State uh, in the linguistics department, but uh, a lot of people, I, I don't think they appreciate enough the, the wonder, just, just how amazing it is uh, that babies, toddlers, even you know, young kids, they can learn this uh, forbidding. I mean, <laughs> this system of language—it's—it's it's so complex 
and so sophisticated and they're just absorbing it uh, so quickly. Uh, it's truly just uh, one of the most um, stunningly miraculous things uh, about human beings that we learn language. Uh, but anyway, it's never a perfect process. No matter, again, no matter how articulate you are, uh, there is a lot of uh, creativity, for lack of a better word, that goes into taking those meanings, putting them into words, putting them into pictures. Uh, so that's where a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of sources, uh, sources of confusion can enter into it. But then if that wasn't bad enough, uh, you have the decoding, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the decoding process. I'm talking about it, <laughs> noises. Uh, and that's the process of interpreting those messages from others into meaning. Uh, so again, we got a step here where somebody has to take this meaning, put it into words, and then or pictures or whatever it is, body language. And then over here, this person is decoding it, uh, so that you can see already there's a lot of room for error uh, to creep in, and you know as though uh, this is never going to be 100%. There's always going to be some problems, uh, or you could look at it the other way. <laughs> there could be some opportunities. Uh, now, the goal of interpersonal communication is to arrive at a, what they call a shared meaning. And not, notice it's shared meaning, it's not, uh, the, the goal is not to arrive at the uh, perfect meaning or at the, at the one meaning. <laughs> so, so a sentence could only mean one thing, but no, it's just something we can share. Uh, and the shared meaning is, is defined as a situation in which the people involved in interpersonal communication attain the same understanding about ideas, thoughts, and feelings. So they attain the same understanding about ideas, thoughts, and feelings. That is the uh, the goal there, to have this, this shared meaning. And so I tell you, you know, I have a, something in mind now. I'm putting it into words. So you're listening to it. I'm encoding. You're decoding. And what we're trying to do is, is come to this understanding about what all this stuff means, right, and how you should feel about it and think about it. Uh, and if I'm successful at this, then the interpersonal communication is a success, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you come away thinking something completely different, uh, that would be uh, either a failure on the encoding or the decoding process. Now, how could there be a failure? Uh, you know, assuming that the, you know, the meaning was, the intended meaning was uh, encoded well, uh, and maybe the decoder, maybe everybody's really trying, they're on the same, uh, you know, there's no bad actors in the situation, everyone's trying to uh, arrive at a shared meaning. What are some of the ways that things can go bad, or uh, some problems? And they talk here about noise, and I think this is a good uh, way to think about it if you work with uh, radio, uh, microphones, audio. Uh, recording like I'm doing, uh, there's always this problem of noise in the signal. Uh, so if you have a noisy signal, uh, that can introduce all kinds of uh, problems, basically just static um, or some kind of uh, interference, um, you know, that can affect, maybe sometimes you can't even really listen to the, you can't understand what someone on the radio is saying because there's too much uh, interference going on. And so it's that sort of idea, but it's applied broadly uh, to any of these interpersonal communication scenarios. So let's talk about some of these different kinds of noise. And the first is kind of what the word suggests, a physical noise, uh, external, no external noise that makes a message difficult uh, to hear or otherwise receive. So it could be literally a noise. So if you might be sitting, sitting in a classroom, you're trying, you know, professors, they're lecturing, you're trying to listen, uh, but someone next to you is uh, munching on a bag of chips. You know, they're crunching and it's just driving you crazy. Uh, it could be something like that. Uh, it could be just uh, maybe there's a loud siren or someone's mowing the grass outside. Uh, I mean, you know what a noise is. Uh, but consider the uh, how that poor signal you know, on a phone conversation or, or it could be a blurry video. Uh, and they talked about, you know, sometimes you go to see a presentation and the projector's not working correctly, right? Or there's a there's a big light like right on the flat, uh, shining on the screen, making it hard to see uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, so these are all physical. What, what's classified as a physical noise? Uh, the physiological noise is a and obviously something to do with physiology. <coughs> so something within the body. 
And so some people uh, have hearing problems, uh, illnesses, uh, vision problems, memory loss. You know, there's all manner of uh, uh, conditions that affect your ability to, 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 to decode, but also uh, the encoding too, right? We, uh, I know people, professional academics that have a, st a stutter. And you know some of these folks, and they might have facial tics to go along with this. And uh, I'm always uh, impressed with these folks. They have the, the confidence to overcome these. Uh, and you know it's always generous of an audience not to make too big a deal about these. To get beyond that, I think is part of that active listening. Uh, and quit worrying about the sort of the, these sort of superficial things, the noise. Try to listen, <laughs> get beyond the physiological noise to uh, appreciate what the person is contributing. Uh, I think is a very useful skill. Uh, but anyway, those are physiological noises. Uh, then we have the semantic noise, and semantics just means uh, meaning, or the study of meaning. And this occurs when communicators apply different meanings to the same words or phrases. And they give the example in the book, which I think is, is helpful, but I'll give a slightly different one. Uh, so let's say I was saying that only students with a high GPA should apply to this scholarship. Okay, let's say I, I say that. Um, now, I might be thinking, when I say that word, I might mean uh, a 4.0. <clears throat> you know, maybe I consider that a high GPA. Uh, whereas you might be thinking, or another student in the class might be thinking, uh, well, a 3.0 is, is considered a high GPA. All right, so anything like that, we talked, uh, you know, when, when any of these conversations, we're talking about... Uh, <clears throat> You know, a lot of the job applications will ask you, what is your preferred salary? Or they might say, what do you think is a reasonable salary for uh, someone doing this line of work? And again, you can imagine the semantic noise that could creep in. If this isn't clarified, <clears throat> maybe the employer says, well, yes, of course, you know, we'll pay you, uh, you know, a high salary for this position. And then you get in and you get your first paycheck, you find, oh, my goodness, it's much lower than I anticipated. And that could be a result of the semantic noise. So just uh, noise is a no meaning noise. We don't, we don't, we think we uh, have the same meaning, shared meaning, but we don't. And then the psychological noises. This is um, interference due to attitudes, ideas, emotions, experience during that interaction. And there's lots of uh, cases of this we'll get into. Uh, they, they say here, the demanding impacts of day-to-day -day business can create psychological noise <laughs> uh, for many reasons. Uh, so it could be something as silly as maybe somebody looks like uh, somebody else you know and maybe you don't like that person. Uh, so you're let, allowing that psychological noise to creep in. Really doesn't, this person might be nothing like that other person really, but you're just, since they just happen to look like them or have the same name or something like this, uh, this could be creeping in, uh, and there's all sorts of uh, other examples we'll get into. Uh, just for now, uh, let's think about these different kinds of noises, uh, the uh, physical noises, the psychological, the semantic, the physiological. Uh, which of these do you think um, has the most impact on you? Or can you think of some examples in your life where one of these types of noises had an impact on one of your uh, interpersonal communications and uh, let's just stop there and think about that for a little bit all right so beyond the noises uh, we have these other kinds of barriers to shared meanings and the term they use for <clears throat> this next category is called the filter uh, the filter of lifetime experiences so this is an accumulation of knowledge values expectations and attitudes based on prior personal experiences. And the, uh, <clears throat> no matter what the communication is, it will get filtered through these uh, experiences. Uh, and they say in the book, usually if people have a fairly similar lives, uh, they'll be able to communicate better uh, than people that come from very different backgrounds. And there could be a lot of, uh, they could have very different lifetime experiences. And I think it's really wonderful. I think one of the great strengths of a university like um, St. Cloud State, where we do have so much diversity uh, in the student population, you can really start to see firsthand like how the someone's lifetime experiences uh, can affect uh, the communications, right? And, and the better skills, you know, the more you work with students that have very different lifetime experiences, uh, uh, the better you're able to uh, recognize 
um, you know, what's going on there and then how to filter messages, uh, how to uh, not be so uh, one size fits all, as I like to say, in your approaches to communication. But but to understand, you know, someone that's got a very different uh, yeah, knowledge, you know, this is the basic part of teaching, is this learning, like, what do, this, what do my students already know? And how can I build upon that knowledge? Uh, if you don't have that filter, <clears throat> or if you're not aware of this, it's going to do, uh, you, you'll be a poor teacher, right? And same thing with all these other uh, factors. Um, it's the filter of lifetime experiences. All right, and then we have uh, another important concept here, the uh, emotional intelligence, or they, they talk about emotional uh, hijacking. So if you think about what that term implies, emotional hijacking. And it involves, uh, emotional intelligence involves understanding these emotions, managing emotions to serve our goals, uh, empathizing with others, and then effectively handling, handling relationships with others. And they say that sometimes this concept is referred to as EQ or emotional quotient, and that's just a play on IQ or <laughs> intelligence quotient. As I think we all know people that are very intelligent they have great book smarts, extremely uh, well-educated, let's say. You know, they know so much stuff. Uh, but when it comes to working with people, uh, they seem to falter. They, they don't seem to be aware of uh, how they're making someone angry or they're just droning on and on, no matter, even though the person's obviously very bored and just wants to get away <laughs> from this person. Uh, there's all sorts of examples we see in daily life where a, a lack of EQ, uh, it's probably just as devastating, if not more so, than the lack of IQ. You know, and I would say I know just as many people who maybe they don't really know all that. They haven't read that many books. Uh, they're not real, uh, you know, especially technically skilled at something. Uh, but it doesn't matter to us because they have great EQ and they're able to uh, work with other people so effectively that this, this never really even uh, enters into it. They're still still very successful. You know, these are the type of people that. Uh, collaborate well. Uh, they they can, they can overcome uh, conflicts. You know the people that you go to uh, when you need help. A lot of us, uh, you know, they talk about this in the book. If you need help, sometimes you'll go to someone with higher in emotional intelligence <laughs> than you will. Even if you know that person probably doesn't know as much uh, technically as someone else there in the office. You just prefer this person because they have the, uh, you know, they they work they they communicate well. Uh, they, uh, they'll be able to recognize that you're, you know, having uh, emotional <laughs> problems that need to be uh, dealt with, not just the uh, technical problems, right? Uh, so that's all part of uh, emotional intelligence. It's a really crucial uh, contribution of. Uh... So another term that he talks a lot about is emotional hijacking. Uh, so you think about hijacking uh, this word, you know, the. Um, you know, you're, you're, the plane is flying, it's being piloted sensibly where it's supposed to go. Uh, but if it gets hijacked, uh, that means, uh, you know, all hell breaks loose, right? That you lose control of that plane, uh, the pilot's no longer in control, uh, someone else is in control. And in general, in general, you don't want this to happen. So what, what is the definition of emotional hijacking? It's, it's a situation in which emotions control our behavior, causing us to react without thinking. And we can't help but do this. It's not like this is something you can stop. <laughs> it's, just, it's just how the brain, uh, humans work. And they have a nice diagram here. So sensory signals enter in through the spinal cord. And before they get to that rational part of your brain, which is up here somewhere, and they go through this older region, the emotional part of the brain or the limbic system. And this is basically a survival adaptation. You can go back to you know, prehistoric <laughs> Neolithic times, however far back you want to go. This it's not it's not bad that it's set up this way. It's not an accident. And this is just uh, evolution working to keep you alive, <laughs> keep, you, uh, keep you out of danger, right? The uh, fight or flight response, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but sometimes it can happen, and you probably know people too that uh, you know they don't seem you know any little thing, and suddenly they don't seem to be in control anymore. You know, they're having this, what we might call a hyper reaction, or they're hyper emotional about something, even when it doesn't really seem to warrant uh, getting uh, that, to have that strong of a response. And a lot of this, it's kind of interesting. 
I was reading some studies about reality television, which you probably know I do a lot of work with uh, pop culture, rhetoric of pop culture. And one of the things they're finding is that, uh, you know, people are watching these reality shows and they're trying to model their own behavior or sense of what's appropriate based on what they're seeing in these programs. Now, what they don't know, or maybe they know and don't care, but anyway, uh, all these programs, they have producers and co-producers that you don't see on the screen, but they're always out there trying to egg on uh, everyone on that reality show. They really try to ratchet up as much as possible the drama uh, because they really want, nobody wants to see sort of just people boring people to having everyday conversations uh, going about their daily lives in a peaceful fashion. No, that's not good entertainment. Uh, what's good entertainment is when you've got people emotionally jacked up and they're yelling, they're screaming, they're crying, they're, you know, whatever the emotion is, it seems to be on steroids. You know, that's what makes for better viewing. Uh, but anyway, the, the people watching these programs sometimes uh, think, well, that's the way I'm supposed to act. Uh, so they're finding that these uh, reality shows are actually causing uh, our behavior to change. And so it's kind of interesting. And maybe you know people like this or that. Uh, get offended if you don't get emotional en enough uh, about something. I, uh, you know, I tend to be a very <laughs> non-emotional kind of guy. I'm usually very calm, laid back. Everybody says uh, Matt Barton is a very laid back professor, and that usually works well. Uh, but in situations where the uh, where it is expected that I would be a lot more emotional, you know, maybe someone says something inappropriate uh, in my classroom, for example, I, I tend to not get angry. Uh, enough uh, to satisfy you know those folks you know I'm still kind of a, a little too laid back and so that might almost be the opposite of this concept you know maybe the uh, maybe sometimes it's, it's warranted but anyway I want you just to think you don't have to give details uh, obviously but just think about a time uh, where you you felt like you were emotionally hijacked or your emotions sort of took over and in retrospect you wish you could have maintained more control uh, managed that better or, or quickly more quickly got over the emotional hijacking and able to think about the situation uh, more clearly. So has that ever happened to you? Uh, that's basically all I want to know. All right, so this author, I guess this isn't the author, but the <laughs> professional communicators have uh, divided you know, emotional intelligence into uh, these four different domains. And each uh, one of these is interesting in its own right, but uh, I think it, it does make sense to break them up like this. So we'll talk about self-awareness and self-management, uh, empathy, and relationship management. Uh, first up is uh, self-awareness. Uh, so this is the, what they call the foundation uh, for emotional intelligence. In other words, the most important one, the one that if you don't have self-awareness, all the rest of it is a moot point. And it involves accurately understanding your emotions as they occur and how they affect you. All right, so here we have some examples of low self-awareness thoughts versus high self-awareness thoughts. And by the way, these are the, this is exactly the sort of thing you would get up to if you were going to um, most types of therapy, or counseling. Uh, the goal a lot of the times is to get you from just having thoughts and not reflecting on them uh, to being able to recognize, hey, I'm thinking this or I'm feeling this way. Why am I feeling this way? And, and knowing enough about yourself to know how to adjust uh, to the situation. It's really a vital, vital skill. Uh, so let's look at some examples here. And they get plenty more in the book. These are just kind of uh, some quick, quick uh, recaps. Uh, but we have Jeff uh, thinking about Letitia there, and he's thinking, uh, well, she needs to learn how to trust people. She's not being fair to me. She needs to understand the constraints I'm facing. So if you think about what he's thinking, or think about his, those thoughts there. He's ignoring, deflecting his feelings. He's just focusing on what he perceives as Leticia, uh, Leticia's misperceptions. That's low self-awareness. Now with some training or some counseling therapy, uh, he might become, uh, or just self-training, he might be able to become more self-aware and develop a, into a high level of self-awareness. So compare the first one to the second one here. So in the second one, he's thinking, I'm bothered that she doesn't trust my motives. Typically, I feel disrespected when others don't trust my motives. Sometimes I lash out 
in these circumstances. So there, he recognizes and he, that he feels distrusted. He also recognizes that he often says things he later regrets in these situations. Uh, so people that are more uh, self-aware than others will be better at uh, basically getting them into, themselves into predicaments uh, that they later on uh, deeply regret. Uh, you might know yourself well enough to know, well, uh, you know, these, these are some pet peeves of mine, and I need to be aware of my pet peeves and not let that, uh, you know, hijack me <laughs> when I'm grading papers, let's say. Or when a, you know, a student walks in late, and uh, that's something I think that bothers most uh, professors when that happens. And someone that's uh, with a low self-awareness might just think, well, look, this person just doesn't care about me. They don't disrespect. They, they're disrespecting me. They don't care about the class. It's sort of low self-awareness. Uh, whereas someone that's a little more uh, self-aware might be thinking, well, this. I know that this kind of thing bothers me. It, it bothers me because you know maybe deep down I'm a little bit insecure about my uh, confidence level. I don't want to lose control uh, of the classroom. I want the, the students to have a to respect me and so on and so forth and i know that uh, when this happens sometimes it can derail my um, attention span my train of thought uh, whatever or i might uh, start being um, nasty to this person you know whatever it is it's it's going to vary depending on who you are uh, that's really what this is all about right is becoming aware of <laughs> yourself <laughs> and then uh, once i'm aware of these kind of feelings and, and thoughts that i have when that occurs then i can adjust all right, and then I can uh, avoid uh, saying or doing something that I will regret later, sort of in the heat of the moment. And here's what it looks like from Letitia's uh, point of view. Uh, so she thinks, this is ridiculous. This is the low self-awareness. Uh, Jeff promised me that I'd be working on this healthcare initiative. How can he go back on his words so quickly? So they say there she's overreacting to Jeff's words because she's not aware of how past disappointments are affecting how she is judging Jeff. So if you read the book, you know that this has sort of happened to her before these previous internships. Uh, they promised it would be very rewarding. She'd get a lot of flexibility, get to do basically some really cool stuff. And then the, that fell apart. She ended up just doing some data entry. <laughs> she had never done data entry. <laughs> Dreadfully boring kind of work. So it's kind of like the old bait and switch where she basically got lied to, that's how she feels. But in this first example, she's not really factoring that in. You know, she's not aware of how much these past disappointments are affecting her with, with this interaction. Now with more self-awareness, uh, compare this. So here's Leticia again. I feel afraid and confused. Jeff doesn't seem to care if I have challenging work. I felt this way before at other jobs. I wonder how my past experiences are impacting how I'm judging Jeff. Uh, so it's really clear to me anyway, probably to you as, as well, how, you know, how more, how better reflective this second one is. You can see how she, she's thinking about these past events and their effect on this current one. Uh, she's not rushing to judgment now. You know, I could think of countless examples of, uh, <coughs> of this as well in my life. Uh, you know, I tell students this all the time, especially in 191, English 191. I, you know, I say that a lot of you in 191 have, have had experiences with other English classes. Uh, you might have done poorly. Uh, you might have gotten lots of red ink on your papers. You might have been uh, convinced or even told sometimes you're not a good writer. Uh, you, you got all these Fs on essays, you know, whatever it is. Uh, so you need to be aware of how uh, these past uh, traumas really can shape uh, how you're feeling now. Right, and even even affect your future. Maybe you can, uh, be, by becoming more self-aware of these things, sort of be able to take a step back and say, you know, yes, I know this will have an impact on me. I know this might lead me to procrastinate, let's say, uh, but I want to uh, become once I become aware of it, uh, then I might be able to manage it better or even uh, eliminate it. Uh, so why don't we take another pause here and think about. Um, you know, some kind of writing scenario, <laughs> uh, you know, an English class that you're having or you're hearing a lecture, whatever it is, something that happened to you in school. And think about how you might have uh, initially reacted with low self-awareness uh, to that situation. Uh, but then maybe uh, how would you have responded differently if you had a little more self-awareness? So I'm sure there's some some aspect, some something uh, in your life 
in your schooling or work life where you learn to become more self-aware. So you don't necessarily need to go into details about it, uh, but I'd be interested to know if you have a, if you have a, a scenario that you can relate uh, from your life to what's going on here with Jeff and Letitia. All right, self-management. Uh, this is the ability to use awareness of your emotions to stay flexible and to direct your behavior positively, or at least, you know, at least where you want it to go. So it involves the discipline to hold off on current urges to meet long-term intentions. And it involves uh, responding productively and creatively to feelings of self-doubt, worry, frustration, disappointment, and nervousness. And so again, the goal is not to feel. <laughs> or the goal shouldn't be to eliminate feelings. Uh, you know, you don't want to become um, some type of computer uh, or robot. So yeah, you're, you're always going to have self-doubt. You're going to be worried about things. Think, you, you know you're going to be disappointed. Uh, you, know, you know you'll be nervous. You know, I've heard plenty of actors say that if you're not a little bit nervous before going on stage, you know, that's actually a bad thing. Uh, because if you have no nervousness, or if you if you're sort of have a high level of self-awareness, you're able to use this nervousness to your advantage to, I guess, put in that little bit of extra energy into your performance. Uh, whereas somebody that's not nervous at all, maybe they're getting almost sort of, uh, you know, what I might call overconfident. You know, at that point and, and not feel like they need to go that extra mile. Um, so there's all kinds of ways to respond productively and creatively uh, to all of these elements and not be overwhelmed by them. You know, I've known plenty of peop uh, speakers and teachers and, you know, they, they talk about the, uh, uh, the imposter syndrome. Uh, so a lot of teachers and professors have this feeling deep down like somehow they really shouldn't be there. Like they have somehow managed to con people <laughs> into thinking they have the, uh, the competence they need to be teaching this class and the knowledge, but uh, really somehow they just fell through the cracks and they don't belong there. Uh, they're just kind of imposters. And they're always, they always have this feeling and it can really start to eat away at their confidence. It can affect everything they do. Uh, it can make them want to, um, you know, lecture as little as possible, let's say. Uh, or whatever it is. I mean, there's many different ways it can manifest itself. Uh, maybe they just give everybody A's uh, because they don't feel like they're uh, qualified enough to give people negative <laughs> evaluations and things. Uh, so that's just one example uh, from a field I'm, I'm really aware of. Uh, but you could think too about uh, you know, maybe your own feelings. If you do have self-doubt, worry, or anger, or whatever it is, the point again, not to uh, eliminate those feelings, but learning how to manage them in a productive fashion. Now, so here again, some low self-management thoughts versus the high self-management thoughts. So in this first one, Jeff is thinking, if Letitia is going to treat me like I'm the bad guy, then maybe I should just turn her over to someone else so I don't have to worry about her. So there he's assuming the worst, he's frustrated, he's considering uh, something that would be extreme or over an overreaction. He's basically being carried away here. Now, if he was more, if he had better self-management, this is what he might be thinking. Now, Letitia is probably reacting this way because she cares so much about a health initiative which helps the employee of employees of this company. She is eager to contribute. Uh, so there he's assuming a positive explanation uh, for that, uh, short-circuiting his feelings from frustration and moderating that anger. You know, and again, this is something that comes up all the time. Uh, with teaching when I'm talking to uh, new teachers, uh, they will tend to interpret things in sort of the worst possible way. Like again, that example of the student coming in late. Uh, they might assume, well, look at this person, they're coming in late, they're disrespecting me, they don't care about the class, uh, or maybe they might take it personally, like, uh, well, maybe this person feels confident coming in late because I have no discipline, right? Or I'm unable to control uh, the class and nobody, <laughs> it's like all this sort of self-doubt and worry all over the place. And that could be, uh, that could manifest itself as a ang really just unfair anger uh, towards a student where somebody with a little more self-management would be thinking, well, there's all kinds of ways. There, who knows what could be going on in that uh, student's life? You know, they've got much, a lot more stuff going on in this classroom. It's not all about me and, and my class. Um, you know, trying to find more positive explanations for it, not just assuming the worst possible thing uh, right off the bat. 
Now, so here's uh, some of these thoughts from Letitia's point of view. Uh, so the first one she's saying, there's no way I can change anything. Jeff will assign me to another project, and that's that. I'm stuck in another dead-end internship. And they call this a pessimistic point of view. Uh, and the other example, she says, I want to express to Jeff my desire to work on a meaningful project. We can discuss how my approach could be applied to another project. So in other words, a more optimistic view, a more productive view. Um, and again, to bring this back to education, <laughs> you know, it's kind of uh, one of the problems I hear about all the time uh, from teachers is that they have a class that won't talk. Then they'll say, I've got this class and I'm trying to get the students engaged. I'm trying to get them to participate, but they just won't talk. You know, it, it's obvious they're, they're just not doing the reading. You know, it's kind of a pessimistic view, right? Or they'll say, um, <laughs> you know, these students are just too, uh, they're too undeveloped, they're too unprepared, or, you know, something like this. It's got a very negative view, either towards themselves or to their students. When really they should be thinking these, uh, trying to find a more optimistic view, a more positive view. Uh, so maybe it's not that the students are lazy, or they're not doing the reading or something like that. Maybe they're just more introverted. They would prefer to be doing uh, uh, more small group activities and more uh, writing based activities than, than speaking up in front of a class. You know, maybe they're really nervous about speaking up in class and maybe they've been uh, had some trauma of when they've done that in the past. Uh, you don't really know. Uh, so it doesn't pay just to be pessimistic about it. You know, why don't you at least start off being optimistic and see where that can get you uh, before you jump into the, the pessimism. Um, so again, this is some self-management thoughts. You can sort of see, it's almost like we've got ESP. We're seeing people's thoughts. <laughs> it's kind of strange in a way. Uh, but the thing is, you, you can become more self-aware uh, of your thoughts and feelings and, and manage them better. All right, then we, moving, uh, we move on to empathy, uh, the ability to accurately pick up on emotions in other people and understand what is really going on with them. So really crucial skills, probably one of the most difficult skills. Uh, we see it all the time uh, where people misread emotions or they uh, are too dismissive of emotions. And it can really uh, you know, <laughs> get you uh, in a lot of trouble. You know, if, if you're not able to recognize it when someone's highly emotionally charged uh, or be able to recognize the opposite, right? Maybe somebody seems a little strangely calm. It's, uh, there's uh, <laughs> reasons that you need to become aware of this, to be able to empathize and understand what's going on. Yeah, be showing an interest in other people. Now, this is where we get into the active listening uh, that, again, I think is so vital. So this is just a person's willingness and ability to hear and to understand. So they, they have to be willing to do it, and they also have to have the ability to do it. And again, people tend to think about listening as just a, such a passive process, whereas really, it's a, there's so much going on. I mean, there's a skill, <laughs> paying attention uh, does not come naturally. You know, you work, <laughs> if you don't believe that, just uh, you know, hang out with some small kids. Uh, just for a few minutes and you'll see how hard it is to pay attention. This is something that has to be cultivated uh, over many, many years. Um, holding judgment, you know, not jumping to conclusions. Uh, being able to reflect on what someone's saying, uh, clarifying, summarizing, sharing. We'll get, in, we'll get in all these components here in a minute. Uh, so paying attention. <laughs> the step of active listening involves devoting your whole attention to others and allowing them enough comfort and time to express themselves completely. As others speak to you, try to understand everything they say from their perspective. And they add here that this requires nonverbal communication. Now, so a lot of times what happens, what goes wrong here, let's say somebody comes to your office with, and they want to talk about a problem they're having. Uh, so someone with poor active listening skills, uh, first of all, they probably wouldn't even be really listening to the person. You know, they'd be looking at their clock. They'd be uh, just trying to get the person out of there as quickly as possible. Uh, they would keep interrupting the person and trying to say, well, you know, <laughs> let me just cut to the chase here. Here's what you need to do. And they're not actively listening. And this can actually lead to uh, all kinds of problems. And one of the things I think that hap has happened to me quite often is uh, with some kind of technical issue I'm having with a computer or some software 
And I'll finally get exasperated enough to call the tech support hotline and talk to them about the problem. And sometimes you get someone who doesn't even seem to want to listen to what you're telling them. You know, you're trying to tell them what's wrong with your computer and they keep jumping in and butting in. They'll say, well, you know, never mind all that. Just turn it off and turn it back on again. <laughs> Try that. <laughs> or you need to tell me about your monitor and have you update, let's, let's update your drivers. You saying, I just, I updated my drivers before I called you. That's like the first thing I did. You know, didn't you hear me when I told you that? I said, well, you need to update your drivers. <laughs> That's usually it. <laughs> kind of being, I'm kind of exaggerating, exaggerating that a little bit, but uh, I'm sure something like this has happened to you as well. Uh, you're just not dealing with an active listener. Uh, the second part is holding, withholding judgment or holding off on judging people. Uh, so people won't share their ideas and feelings with you if, if they don't feel safe. You know, if they think that you're going to laugh at them or mock them or disrespect them or, or that you don't like them, uh, that you don't have goodwill towards them, you know, all of these things will just make them clam up and they just won't tell you what's going on. And of course, this can be deadly. A lot of uh, jobs, you know, people feel so uncomfortable with their manager or supervisor. Maybe they don't want to mention to this, this person that, you know, there's something potentially dangerous going on, uh, but they're too afraid to mention it. Uh, they fear they get fired or scolded, uh, whatever. Uh, they don't want to look bad. I think it might make them look bad to the manager. You know, all these things can actually have uh, uh, fatal consequences. And you can read about the, uh, the Challenger disaster. You know, it's one example of that. Uh, where people felt too uncomfortable uh, pointing, uh, even though they were aware that there were these, some people were well aware of these problems, but they just, they were so uncomfortable sharing their, those feelings uh, that nothing got done and people died. Big disaster, big tragedy. As a, uh, withholding judgment is particularly important in tense and emotionally charged situations. Uh, so I think about, uh, you have an accident in your car, let's say, a car accident. Now, it's perfectly natural to be emotionally charged in those situations, especially if you're injured um, or even if you're just really upset about the car, <laughs> whatever. Uh, so when the officer shows up, uh, one of the things uh, he or she has to do is, you know, not jump to conclusions, right, but try to get everybody calmed down, uh, try to figure out what uh, actually happened uh, before they start trying to figure out who's to blame. Right, the last thing you want to do is uh, just start assigning blame because if someone's trying to tell you uh, what happened and they pick up on the fact that you already have judged them guilty, that you're already blaming them for it, uh, that's going to make them, that's going to totally uh, uh, derail the communication. So they say one of the best ways to make others feel comfortable is to, to uh, demonstrate a learner mindset rather than a judgment or a judger mindset. Now, so what do we mean by these two different mindsets? Uh, with a learner mindset, you show an eagerness to hear others' ideas and perspectives and listen with an open mind. Now, you, don't, you do not have your mind made up before listening fully. And most people are, some people lack this, but most people, they, you know, they'll come in, they'll start talking to you, and they can tell whether uh, you actually want to hear their ideas whether they're, you know, again, are you constantly looking at the clock? Um, are you <laughs> sitting, are you making eye contact with them as they're talking? Uh, or are you uh, sort of looking like you're dozing off or your eyes are glazing over? You know, this is all part of uh, body, you know, the nonverbal communication that we'll get into. But it's kind of the opposite of this learner mindset. I mean, you're not, you're not eager. You don't really want to hear what they're saying. Uh, you've already got your mind made up. You know, maybe in the context of teaching, maybe the maybe I've already made my mind up about a student. Uh, I feel like the student just doesn't care about the class, uh, doesn't value the, the subject. Uh, so when they come to the office and they're talking about uh, a project they're working on um, or trying to explain why some work was late, let's say, I'm not even really listening to them and they can pick up on that. Uh, they, they can tell my mind's already made up. And so that'll probably just make them angry <laughs> They'll probably go to uh, ratemyprofessor.com and write a nasty review, uh, something like that. It won't be a productive uh, meeting at all. Uh, so let's talk about the opposite of that listening approach, the, the judger mindset. Uh, so this is, you know, like I say, the mind is made up. Before you even hear what they have to say, um, you are, you're ready to judge them. Yeah, most people can pick up on this and they don't like it at all. 
Uh, they don't tolerate disagreement. Or if they do, they view disagreement rigidly with little possibility of finding any common ground. Uh, so we all know people like this that are, if you ever worked a job, and you know, there's always somebody there that, you know, their way is the only way, and uh, anybody else, any other views, any other uh, suggestions, it's, well, that's just because you're stupid. Uh, that's just because you're the new person. You don't have any experience. So why, why should I even give you the time of day? Uh, and we don't like this. You know, nobody likes to deal with a, uh, this judger mindset. And then we've got learner statements uh, versus uh, the judger statements. So the learner statements are showing your commit commitment to hearing people out. You know, so again, you're setting aside some time. Uh, you're not interrupting all the time. Uh, you're letting them tell their story and you're maybe even taking notes. You know, this can be a way to show that you're uh, really listening. Uh, the judger statements though, it shows you're closed off to hearing people out. You're shutting down on honest conversations. You know, your, your mind is already made up. There's really no point in even continuing. Uh, so you got some examples here from the book again. Uh, so Lisa, you're basing your, this is the judger statement. Uh, you're basing your conclusions on just a few people you've talked to. Why aren't you concerned about finding out more about the costs? So you can see from that, she implies that Jeff is not concerned about the costs. He isn't open to learning more. And this is just probably gonna make uh, Jeff defensive. Whereas the learner statement, I don't know much about continuous feedback systems. What have you learned from the people you've talked to? That's a little more neutral, probably lead to more constructive outcome. And here's some more judger statements. Uh, I spend a lot of time, this is Jeff, I spend a lot of time talking to HR directors and know which ones are best at helping their employees stay engaged and productive. Don't you think HR professionals would know more about this than people with a finance background? <laughs> so it's pretty clear. I don't need to really explain that. Uh, you can sense the judginess of this. Now compare it though to this second statement. I've learned several things from HR directors about continuous feedback systems. I need to learn more about the financial implications. Now, based on what I've told you, what are your thoughts about the cost effectiveness? And, you know, usually this is a, you know, just in my experience, even if you have a big disagreement with somebody, if they can tell that you really, you genuinely want to hear, like, what is, how did you arrive at that? You know, tell me where you're coming from, you know, explain, explain your perspective and they can see you're listening uh, carefully, that you're not just dismissing or judging them. Uh, a lot of times that alone is enough for them to, uh, if not, you know, change their mind, at least uh, not to be, uh, you know, hostile towards you. Uh, it, it, people want to be listened to. It's part of uh, being re uh, respected. So active listening requires that you reflect on the ideas and emotions of others. And uh, we're going to talk about some different ways to do this. Uh, they say to make sure you really understand others, though, you should frequently paraphrase uh, what you're hearing. And so what does this look like in practice? So um, somebody tells you something. <laughs> explain something you say well it sounds to me like uh, that's the first one it sounds to me like you think we should replace annual performance reviews with continuous performance reviews because continuous reviews improve employee performance and morale so i'm not going to go through all these examples uh, with you but you get the idea uh, so you're kind of uh saying if you can say well let me see if i could put what you're saying into into my words uh rephrasing it or paraphrasing it and then this gives them a chance to say, yes, that's that's what I mean. Uh, you, that's exactly it. Uh, or, no, that's not what I mean. Uh, clarify, clarifying involves making sure you have a clear understanding. It's a double checking mechanism. So let's take a look at some of these examples. Uh, what are your thoughts on blank? Uh, so Lisa asked, what are your thoughts on considering other ways of conducting annual reviews more effectively? Or could you repeat that? Uh, could you repeat what you just said about evaluating the cost of continuous reviews? <laughs> or I'm uh, just admitting, I, I'm not sure I understand. Right? I'm not sure I understand why the problems with our current annual review process mean that should, we should move away from annual reviews. Uh, so can you explain how or what might be your role in? Now, see, these are all ways of getting, uh, of clarifying a statement. 
And it's a lot more productive than just uh, being disagreeable or, or judging, uh, giving those judging statements. So summarizing and sharing. Uh, the goal of summarizing then is to restate the major themes so that you can make sense of the big issues from the perspective of the other person. In other words, the, the big takeaways. And so that paraphrasing would be just rewording a little bit one of their statements, let's say, uh, whereas now we're backing up, we're looking at the whole, uh, the whole gist of what they're concerned about. So your main concern is blank. So your two main, this is Jeff. Uh, so your two main concerns are that moving to a continuous review process will be costly and impractical. And the software and time needed in the process will cost far more than what we had to invest. Also, it may be difficult to get all the employees to participate often in this process. Is that right? And so if you can, if I talk to you, if I give you the, um, and let's just say I talk to you for 20 minutes about an assignment, then you might say, well, let me see if I can sum this up in my own words, uh, what, what it is you want us to do. You know, A, B, and C. And I can say, yes, <laughs> that's exactly it. And so that really goes a long ways towards uh, uh, arriving at that shared understanding, if you can do that. Okay, let's just uh, pause it here for a minute. And so I want us to go back to that, um, that clip again of office space and uh, think about the stuff we've been talking about, uh, the self-management, uh, the self-awareness, uh, these different kinds of uh, noises, you know, all this technical stuff we've talked about so far. Uh, that can go uh, awry with communication, empathy, uh, all of it. <laughs> and again, go back to that clip from the office, uh, or office space rather, and see if you can pick out a few examples uh, where there's um, some low self-awareness, some low self-management, and, and how that's having an impact on arriving at a shared understanding. All right, so to move on then, uh, we've got all kinds of barriers to effective listening and some of this stuff is common sense you know obviously if you don't have enough time or you don't give someone enough time uh, that's not going to be effective uh, lack of patience attention span an image of leadership uh, a bad image uh, defending being too defensive being afraid to hear bad news uh, technological issues uh, me too statements giving advice and judging so these are all different kinds of uh, barriers and here's some examples of uh, defensive and non-defensive replies. So here's the original statement. I spend a lot of time talking to HR directors and know which ones are best in helping their employees stay engaged and productive. Don't you think an HR professional would know more about this than people with a finance background? So what the listener decodes, you don't know what you're talking about. So let's say you have a finance background, you're not part of HR, so it sounds like this person is just saying, look, I don't even need to listen to you. Uh, you don't know anything about uh, helping employees stay engaged and productive. You're just a finance person. That's how, what this person is decoding. Now they can reply either defensively from a judgmental stance or non-defensively from this learning stance. And so let's look at the first one, the defensive reply. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> Uh, I know a lot about how performance review systems affect employees. In fact, I'm in a far better position to evaluate whether new systems make financial sense than you are. <laughs> Add that part. So they're defensive. They're, you know, they're sort of uh, jacked up uh, from this. They've been basically uh, feeling disrespected. Now let's look at the non-defensive reply uh, from a learner stance. So I think you're, this is uh, the, the statement. I think you're right that we need to pay attention to what other HR directors have learned. Have they told you about the cost of these performance review systems? Or I want to know how we can determine the cost of transitioning to a continuous review system. And what have you learned from HR directors you know about evaluating these costs? So one of the things you'll notice about these responses is that they're in the forms of questions. Right there. So you're asking a question instead of uh, making a counter statement. So that's one way they're less defensive, um, but really they're just more effective. Uh, yeah, that brings us to this, asking the right questions. Uh, a crucial skill is the ability to ask the right questions. Uh, good questions reflect the learner mindset. Poor questions reflect a judger mindset. 
You know, one of the things um, about questions I like to talk about, especially with the 191 students, or really 332 students, when we talk about uh, job interviews, and usually there's a part of a job interview uh, where the interviewer will, tur will turn the tables on you. And they'll say, uh, they'll ask a question something like this. They'll say, well, what questions do you have for us? Or what questions do you have for me? And the wrong thing, I think, is to say, well, I don't have none. <laughs> I don't have any. <laughs> uh, or they'll ask something that's, you know, shows that they weren't listening. Like those, uh, they might say, well, what, you know, what was the, how much am I going to get paid? Or what's the salary? <laughs> Again, you know, something that they should know already or uh, something that's inappropriate to ask about at that time. Uh, but it's just not the sort of questions that would show that you have been listening, uh, that it is an intelligent question. And the same thing in a, a seminar class, you know, the, the professor will say at the end of a lecture, you know, does anybody have questions about the content we've covered? You know, and some students will ask questions that just seem very, uh, uh, superficial, let's say, or, or not even really germane. You know, like, well, how long does this paper have to be again? Or <laughs> how many words does it need to be? Uh, something like this. Had nothing to do with the, whatever the subject was that was covered in that lecture. Uh, whereas somebody that's really put some, that's been actively listening, their question will show uh, that they're learning or that they're thinking about this, uh, uh, this lecture, the material in this lecture, and they'll have a good question. And a lot of times, um, as a professor, I can look at this and, and tell, you know, which students have the uh, in intelligence and the emotional investment uh, versus someone who just wants to get through it and get in and get out, <laughs> you know, just get it over with. Uh, so it's a really important skill to be thinking about, not just asking any question or not asking. A, this is wrong. I think this is terrible for students to think, well, it, the professor will assume if I ask a question that I don't know, uh, that I'm ignorant, or that I haven't been listening. No, and that's not the case at all. A lot of times a question actually shows that you are <laughs> engaged and that you are listening. Uh, it just depends on the question. But anyway, uh, let's look at some of these examples. Uh, so the judger mindset, how come this doesn't work? Uh, versus how is this useful or beneficial? <laughs> Who is responsible for this mess? Uh, that's the judger mindset. Who is responsible for this mess? <laughs> uh, versus the learner mindset. What can we do about this? Uh, let me uh, ask you, which, which do you think this is? Why can't you get it right? <laughs> Judgment. Uh, versus uh, going forward, what can we learn from this? Uh, so all these examples, and you can think of so many, I'm sure, if you ever worked in you ever worked with the public in a sales position, a, a customer service? You know that most people might, maybe not even most, uh, but you will be dealing with this judger mindset so often. And it, isn't it nice, though? <laughs> now, usually the customer service representative will be, will be trained in this learner mindset. Uh, and they'll be asking questions that don't put you on the defensive, uh, that don't uh, escalate the situation. Uh, judgers uh, versus the learner mindset. Uh, so, so here's some types of effective questions, and these are broken into categories, and they, they talk about the first one as being uh, rapport building, building rapport, uh, building, a, I would just say, a positive relationship, maybe even you know, a little bit of a, a little bit towards a, even a friendship, right? Or you're just trying to make the, you know, the tone more friendly, more personable. Uh, so there are some examples of this, and some of these, you get asked this all the time, right? Like, how was your trip to the Human Resources Conference? What did you learn about at the last Chamber of Commerce event? Uh, so these are an opportunity to bond through understanding one another, uh, icebreakers uh, for the substantive conversation about the business issues at hand. And so some people would think, well, you shouldn't do this, right? The, your time is limited. You should just get to the business at hand right away. Uh, but often they find, uh, you know, a little bit of time spent establishing rapport, even if it doesn't directly relate to the subject of the meeting, uh, this can actually be a good thing. It can improve communication enormously. Uh, so you might have professors in your classes the first day. They might just uh, say, well, what? Uh, you know, you, you signed up for this Shakespeare class, let's say. Uh, uh, what other classes have you had? What, what, other, what Shakespeare plays or poems have you studied in other classes? You know, just something like that, just to kind of get the, 
uh, ball rolling a little bit to establish some rapport. Remember the professor tells a story about, um, you know, an incident that happened to them and their first time they read Shakespeare. And then they'll say, well, you know, did you have have you had that experience, an experience like that? You know, just anything that will build rapport. Uh, then we have the the funnel. Now, so the idea here behind beyond uh, behind this metaphor is uh, if you think about the shape of a funnel, <laughs> so, this is not a very good diagram, but you know you can imagine you have a a broad opening and narrowing down and a little trickle coming out. So it's kind of a V shape basically, uh, increasingly specific questions. Uh, so here's the example. So how do you think we should go about researching what our employees think about performance reviews? Uh, so that's the big question. And then we narrow it down a little bit. Uh, how do you think we can capture the employees' perspectives about continuous review systems? And then down a little bit more into the nitty gritty. Uh, what types of survey questions will help us understand their thoughts all the way down to, could you give me a word by word example of how you'd capture that in a survey question? So the funnel is just a progressive breakdown of a problem into manageable pieces. So you start with the big questions and move down into specific things. Now notice the organization here though. You know, you start at the broadest question and then move down into more specific things. So again, a lot of times uh, students will start, they'll do this in reverse, right? And they'll be asking uh, for the word by word example or really specific things about the assignment before they really uh, talked about these bigger picture aspects. And so try to keep this in mind next time you're in this situation. Uh, you may be opening with uh, more with the broad questions, like so the big picture stuff uh, before it's zooming in uh, to the, the fine detail. Uh, other types of questions. Uh, these are the probing, not, not the most pleasant name, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, but trying to probe it almost like you've got a, you know, a specimen there on the on the table and you're uh, poking at it with your uh, probe. <laughs> try, to try, try to see more, try to better understand it. Uh, so here's some examples of probing questions. How often do you receive complaints about the annual performance review process? Uh, what are the concerns of the supervisors? Uh, what ideas do employees have for making the review process fairer? And so you see, you're kind of coming at, the, you're kind of asking different questions. You're trying to get at this problem from different angles. And they say this is an effective technique for getting at root causes uh, and best solutions. You know, I watch a lot of uh, uh, murder mystery shows and crime, have procedural crime dramas, whatever. I think that's what they're called. And I always love the interview stage because usually the, uh, uh, the detectives will be engaged in these these probing questions. And a lot of times you won't even know, like, why are they asking that? Well, that question seemed to come out of nowhere. Uh, but they're really just trying to come at the problem uh, from all, or come, <laughs> come at the mystery, I guess, uh, from all these different angles. They're asking, they just keep asking all these different questions because once they find the right question, a lot of times the mystery is solved. And then that last one is the solution oriented problem or question, sorry. Uh, so how can we find out which software vendors offer the most attractive performance review features? Or what are your ideas for ensuring that employees provide continuous feedback? Uh, what are some best practices in making performance reviews candid and honest, yet also rewarding and productive? Uh, so how can you move, these questions are about moving forward, right? What are the options for moving forward now let's focus on solutions instead of just uh, dwelling on the uh, the problems at hand. All right, so we've been talking about productive questions. Now let's get into uh, the opposite of that, counterproductive questions. And the first of these is uh, one you've probably heard about if you watch a lot of the news or you've taken journalism classes or done any work in statistics and survey collecting. Uh, the leading question. Uh, so these questions are meant to lead the listener to agree with or adopt your perspective. And most people can pick up on this readily and they feel like it's an unfair question. They feel like they're, they've been manipulated. It's not going to lead to a learning conversation. So what is an example of a leading question? So there's a couple. Would you agree that employee engagement and productivity should be our priorities? 
then would you agree that employee engagement and productivity should be our priorities? So what do you think is the answer to that? Do you think that no is a valid response? <laughs> no, of course not. So you, you're sort of asking the question, you, you know where it's going, you know where you're leading this person, and nobody likes this. It's just, it feels manipulative, it feels almost petty. Uh, let's look at another example. I'm sure you think it's a good idea to keep costs under control, right? <laughs> so, so again, it's not a question where it's, you could legitimately say no. You can tell from the way you ask this question that you think it is, and that it is a good idea. And you're not really open to other perspectives. You're just trying to sort of uh, box the person in. So these are leading questions and they should be avoided. Uh, then we have the question that's actually a disguised statement. So it sounds, it's got a question mark on it, but it's not really a question. Uh, you're really just saying, you're stating something, you're making a, a statement, but you're just uh, framing it as a question. I call these design or disguised questions, not real questions. Um, there are statements that say you are closed-minded on this issue. Now, this flaw-finding approach will cause many listeners to become defensive. Yeah, of course. And so you get this all the time, I think, and I do a lot of uh, academic conferences, and there's always a question, or normally always a Q&A session at the end of this, at the end of a, a talk or paper, you know what they call it, basically a presentation. And, you know, somebody will raise uh, their hand and say, I have a question. Right, but when they start to give their question, it actually turns out that you know they've got their own viewpoint uh, on the matter at hand. You know, maybe they've also uh, written about this topic. They, basically, they have an agenda, and their question is not really honest. It's not really the question designed to learn any, anything. Uh, it's just there to either make the person look bad or to advertise, uh, you know, basically advertise uh, their point of view. Uh, so let's look at some examples. So first is, is uh, why do you insist on focusing on costs instead of benefits? So you see there, there's a kind of a claim buried in here that this person is insisting on focusing just on the cost, not even considering benefits. Or don't you think you're jumping to conclusions by paying attention to the opinions of only a few of your close contacts? So you see there the, the, uh, uh, the disguised statement is it the person is paying attention to the opinions of only a few people. They haven't really talked to more people. They've got a, a only a superficial or a narrow understanding of the matter at hand. And then we have uh, the cross-examination. Uh, so this is basically trying to trip people up. Uh, I mean, you, you're kind of fixating on something they said at one point. Now you're saying, well, well you said this at the beginning. Now you're saying something else. Uh, or even going back further than that, you know, <laughs> at the beginning of, on the syllabus you said blah, blah, blah. And now you're saying this. You know, there's all kinds of ways to go about this. And they, and they make a good point in the book. Yes, it might score you some points. You know, maybe it will impress the audience that you're able to put this person on the defensive. Uh, but is it productive? No, of course it's not productive. It's <laughs> counterproductive. Uh, so here's an example from the book on this. Uh, just now, you said annual reviews don't work because they don't happen often enough. Yet last week, you said the real reason our annual reviews fail is not because of how often they occur, but because they don't involve setting goals. So what's the real reason annual reviews don't work? <laughs> and so again, you see this all the time, and unfortunately, academics are terrible about this because they, you know, the kind of training they've had, I suppose, but they. Uh, they, they love to catch somebody contradicting themselves, right? And you see it in political coverage as well, right? This, well, uh, here's what this person said about the same topic uh, just two years ago. You know, look, they're saying the exact opposite. Uh, well, it's again, it kind of makes the, it makes for fun viewing, I suppose, and we, we laugh when we see this, and we feel like, well, this person's so duplicitous. Look, look, they're saying the exact opposite of what they're saying now. Uh, but the, the, the question is, though, is it productive when you're communicating with that person, right? Is, are you uh, building rapport? Are you doing all, are you actively listening, all this stuff? Or are you just trying to put the person on the defensive, uh, trying to escalate a situation, trying to score some points, uh, which you might do, you might score some points, <laughs> but <laughs> is it productive or not? That's the question. Uh, generally it's, it's not. 
Uh, and then with empathy, there's also some traps of empathy, things to avoid. Uh, givers, we talked about this last time, right? The givers and the takers. Uh, so sometimes givers can help uh, others at the expense of their individual performance. Uh, givers perform best when they address the, um, well, let me just give some examples of this from my experience. And I work mostly with uh, new teachers. A lot of my graduate students and upper level uh, students are interested in teaching uh, or training of some sort. And one of the situations I run into is that the, uh, or these students run into the TAs basically. Uh, they'll be spending so much time uh, working on their 191 class and helping out every student in that class and they're just giving all of their time uh, to help out those students. But in the meanwhile, in the meantime, they're not giving themselves enough time to study for their own classes because uh, a TA also takes courses and they're expected to write uh, papers and things. Uh, so they might put these uh, other students that they have far ahead of themselves to the point where it can actually begin uh, to affect their, their grades. Uh, so they might end up uh, not even doing the reading uh, for classes they're taking because they're, you know, they feel like they need to get this, uh, you know, do, do this extra round of uh, student appointments or, or something like that. Uh, so there's definitely a balance that has to be struck. So if that's you, you can think about some of these strategies, um, how to address these barriers to performance associated with empathy, uh, timidity, availability, and emotional concern for others. So maybe you should, should limit your availability you know, this is something I, I do. This is why, uh, you know, some some professors just have wall-to-wall -wall office hours, right? And they, they see that you're only required to be there uh, for 10 hours a week, if, as I recall. I think that's right. Uh, but not, you see, some people, though, they like students so much that they've got so much of a giver personality that they will be in there, you know, maybe 30 or 40 hours a week. Just make themselves uh, wide open and available, and they say, you know, you call me. <laughs> they even give their phone and personal phone numbers uh, to students and say, you call me anytime. Well, that's, that's just going too far, right? You're being, you're empathizing way too much. Uh, you know, the students aren't aren't babies. <laughs> you know, they you, they need to be cultivating their own uh, sense of responsibility. And there's start, certainly nothing wrong with saying, this is these are the hours I'm available. You know, sorry if you can't make it make it at this time. Uh, you know, and the same thing too with timidity. Uh, sometimes it's going to affect you. You're, you're timid about uh, anything that might be construed as negative or, or hurting someone's feelings, right? Uh, but sometimes that's what's necessary. All right, so let's talk about learning to sight read, and this is something that I. Uh, really enjoy. You know, I've done a lot of uh, study in this area. It's basically body language, and we find that time and time again that uh, so much shared understanding is, is about body language, and it's not uh, listening to every word that somebody says. A lot of it is, uh, you know, the tone in which they say it, uh, you know, the way that they're standing, uh, the way that they move, uh, their, their hand gestures. All of this stuff. Uh, can be so effective that we learn so much more by imitating uh, what people do uh, than listening to what they say. You know, we could think about this in so many ways, right? But that's just <laughs> the way humans work. Uh, I think we tend to exaggerate, highly, highly exaggerate uh, the value of verbal uh, discourse, uh, uh, oral and written language. We think that's paramount. When really all this other stuff, even like a subtle, things you're not even aware of, subtle body movements, uh, subtle shifts in tone, uh, these sort of things can have an enormous impact on learning. Uh, but anyway, how can you do, how can you begin to develop some skills uh, in learning to sight read uh, body language? And they say first, just consciously practicing each day. In other words, just being aware. <laughs> you know, it's, there's so many opportunities where you can study. Uh, people's uh, uh, body language, nonverbal communication, emotional states. Uh, even, you know, you're riding a bus, you're in an elevator. You know, most people's first instinct is to whip up, you know, grab that cell phone, uh, that smartphone, and start checking that. Uh, when really they're missing out on an opportunity to, to study. You know, what is this person, the way people are sitting there, the way people are walking and standing, uh, the space uh, they're putting between each other. You know, all this stuff is... Uh, 
it's, it's, it's fascinating, but you're not going to learn it uh, from a book. And this is something you have to consciously practice every day. Uh, paying attention to congruence. And so they talked about lying in the book. And how can you tell if somebody's lying to you? Or how can you tell if somebody's nervous? And the, somebody might say, well, if they don't make eye contact with you, then they're probably lying. Uh, it's hard to look somebody in the face and lie. And that's just not true. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a, a false. Uh, but it might be a clue. It might be one indicator, but only if you think about all the other stuff going on. Now, so one of the things about lying is they'll, they'll say they might look you in the eye, but that's something that they're kind of hyper aware of as a liar. Uh, they, they know this too, that if you don't make eye contact, they probably won't believe you. Uh, so you'll be sure to pay it. You'll, you'll, you'll be sure to make a little eye contact. Uh, but you might not be aware of your uh, your feet and your feet movement or your hand movements. And so if you see somebody not making eye contact or what, who cares if they are or they're not, but you notice they're shifting their feet a lot, uh, they're wringing their hands, uh, they're putting their hands over their mouth, you know, all of these, uh, all of this stuff might add up and you know to a, a clue <laughs> it might add up to pretty good evidence that they're lying uh, but just looking at one thing individually probably won't uh, clusters of people or clusters of movements not isolated things so again not uh, the eye contact alone doesn't really tell you much factor in all these other elements maybe it's an indicator and then of course being aware of the context uh, if you just look at people, you can't hear what they're saying, you have no clue uh, what it's about, it's probably not going to be very valuable. Now, just uh, one thing I'll add to this is uh, one of the things I don't think gets emphasized enough with um, actors is how good they are at this. You know, so you think acting is more about just speaking a line, speaking your lines effectively, but really there's so much more uh, about the making the body language fit. And that's not an easy skill. And if you ever see an amateur a theatrical production, you, you can quickly get aware of this and really start to recognize, you know, a really good actor. It's so much more than just verbal intonation. Uh, even the way they're sitting, standing, uh, the, the way they move around as they're talking, little subtle stuff sometimes, all that stuff has to be carefully trained. All right, so we're about to getting close to, closer to the end here. Uh, now we're talking about relationship management. So the ability to use your awareness of emotions and those of others to manage interactions successfully. And it's about adapting communication to the preferred styles of others and ensuring civility. Uh, so here we're talking about uh, communication preferences based on motivational values and uh, if, again, if you think back to that office space clip, this is what they were, they talked about, right, was motivating uh, employees. What actually motivates uh, employees? They were having a bit of humor in the movie, of course, but uh, this is a legitimate question. And they say here, many communication styles can be traced to motives and values. Uh, people have a blend of motives. And we, we have nurturers, which will be blue, and, and the thing we'll look at here in a second, a directing uh, motive identified as red and autonomizing which is green and we uh, talk about a MVS or motivational value system is your blend of these motives and refers to the frequency with which these values guide your actions and so what we'll see I guess is that some people tend to be more inclined towards either being nurturing directing or autonom autonomizing and so people with the blue MVS are most often guided by motives to protect others, to help others grow, and act in the best interests of others. Uh, so that sounds to me a lot like most teachers or most uh, medical uh, professionals or most uh, you know, law enforcement, anything of that sort. <clears throat> professionals with a red MVS are most often guided by uh, concerns about organizing people time, money, and other resources to accomplish results. I'd call these something like that, very goal-oriented folks. And then people with the green MVS are most often concerned about making sure business activities have been thought out carefully and that the right processes are put into place to accomplish things. Uh, so these are the folks that might seem to get hung up on uh, details, right? And they you know, sometimes it can seem like you can't get anything done because this person keeps just 
you know, poking holes and uh, raising questions about everything. And they can't, we can't move forward. You know, we're kind of doing all this talking and not enough doing. You know, I can think of uh, individuals that fit this process. But, you know, a more charitable way to look at them is to say, yes, they're just really concerned about uh, making sure everything has been thought out. Uh, that we've, re we've really adhered to the process, Robert's Rules of Order, you know, whatever it is. Uh, this is what motivates them. And then hubs are people who are guided about equally uh, by all three of these NVSs. So it's now move on. Let's move on to the reds, uh, assertive and directing motivation. So they're primarily concerned with accomplishing a task, uh, the use of time and money, uh, resources to achieve the desired results. And they like a fast-moving, competitive uh, environment, <laughs> stimulating. Potentials, uh, potential for personal advancement and development. And these are people, they're up and coming people. <laughs> they're on the go. <laughs> uh, they're go-getters. Uh, people feel best when they're leading uh, groups, uh, directing other folks. Uh, they feel most rewarded when they're acting with strength and ambition, achieving excellence, uh, leading and directing others. And what they, they fear is being seen as gullible, indecisive, or unable to act. Now what triggers their conflicts? Uh, when others are too forgiving and don't fight back, you're not standing up for yourself. You know, uh, you don't. They don't provide clear expectations about rewards. You know, because this is what they want is the reward, getting the task done, and it's irksome. You know, when it's not clear how to get that. Uh, overdone strengths, confidence, arrogance, uh, abrasive personalities, uh, competitive, combative. You know, so I know people like this, and I'm sure you do too. Uh, if you play any sports, you always or games, you know, some people are just uh, they totally fit this profile, right? And they really just have a hard time. You know, if they're not leading a group, you know, they have a hard time uh, being supportive. Uh, they feel like they have to to lead. And in classes, I see these folks as the ones who, you know, they're the ones that tend to uh, they they have to answer every question. You know, it just feels like they, the class has to be focused on them. <laughs> and they seem to be less, uh, you know, they're quick to take charge, uh, but they do have some problems, right? It's not good to be too far in this direction. Yeah, they can, they can tend to be overconfident sometimes. I think it's probably the uh, what I see most often, or, or even arrogant. And then the, the greens, uh, analytical and autonomizing. So this is kind of an interesting one. So they're primarily concerned about uh, having assurance that things have been properly thought out. Meaningful order established, self-reliance, self-defendance, or self-dependence. <laughs> and they prefer clarity, logic, precision, focus on self-reliance, effective use of resources. Uh, they like to pursue their own interests without needing to rely on others, right? This is one reason why they do like to have clear instructions and clear policies because they don't want to have to keep going to people and asking about things. Uh, they want it spelled out. Uh, they feel most rewarded when they're working with others in a fair, clear, logical, and <laughs> rational manner. And then what they fear is being seen as overly emotional or exploitive of others. And why do they not like what triggers their conflicts when others don't take issues seriously, push their help on them, uh, do not weigh all the facts when making a decision. So I think, uh, you yeah, know, overdone strengths, let's see. Uh, a fair and unfeeling, analytical or nitpicking, methodical or rigid. So I don't, <laughs> I definitely recognize there's some green <laughs> uh, in myself. You know, definitely some of these issues, uh, you know, I definitely can identify with some of these positions. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, look at the last one here, and then I'll get your take. So I guess the hub is where we want to end up, where we want to be working, what we want to be working towards, flexible and coherent. Uh, so there, again, flexibility is the key word here. Welfare of the group, but also the sense of belonging in the group. Uh, so community building. Uh, they like a friendly, flexible, social, fun environment. They like to build consensus, uh, encourage interaction. They like uh, to coordinate it with others. They're good team members, loyal, direct when necessary. They know when to follow rules. Uh, what they don't want to be perceived as is just being subservient or domineering 
or isolated. Now what triggers their conflicts when others are not willing to consider alternatives, insist on only one way of doing things, basically inflexible people? Now at the extremes, they can end up just being uh, wishy-washy, right, or option-oriented, uh, basically flip-flopping all the time, indecisive, uh, tolerant, or uncaring. Uh, so we talked about all four of these uh, motivational value systems. So I want you to think about yourself now. Uh, where would you put yourself on this? Uh, where do you think you are? Do you think you're more red, green? You know, where do you put yourself? And do you like that, or do you want to uh, work on it? Uh, just whatever else you want to say about it. All right, so if you know what you're dealing with, or if you know how a certain person is predisposed in terms of their MVS, you might consider uh, using some of these verbs, nouns, modifiers, and phrases with them. And so if it's a, a blue, you know, they like to talk about feelings, being appreciated, caring, help, thanks, support, satisfaction, cooperation, and so on. And reds, I like to talk about things in terms of competition and winning, leading, and dominating. Uh, greens, I have more interest in thinking, analyzing, evaluating, organizing. Uh, whereas the hubs are more into like, brainstorm, uh, let's decide together, <laughs> let's play, experiment. And I think this is a good chart. Let's work together. Let's try this out. <laughs> so that's more of a hub statement. Take our time. Let's get it right. Make sure it's fair. That's green, <laughs> reds, uh, make it happen. Take charge. Go for it. And then blues, uh, let's make sure everyone's best interests are served. Let's look out for everyone. And then we're going to wrap up here with some uh, conversations between a hub and a green. Again, I'm not going to read all this to you. Uh, it's in the book. Uh, but I'll just look at this first example here so you can get, some, get a flavor for what we're talking about here. <clears throat> uh, so Jeff explained, Lisa, I'd like you, Steve, and Leticia to help work with me to implement a continuous performance review system. Our current system of annual performance reviews is really outdated. So this is what Jeff is encoding. Let's work as a team to improve our performance feedback system. And then what Lisa decodes is Jeff is rushing to a decision too quickly and thinks I'm on board. And so you can see this playing out. And this is a really helpful, uh, I really loved uh, all these conversations in here because it shows you how these different, uh, you know, how the reds and the blues and there can be so much uh, miscommunication going on. And if they were just a little bit savvier <laughs> uh, with these uh, uh, NVSs, they could avoid a lot of the confusion, a lot of the uh, hurt feelings, for lack of a better word. All right, so let's uh, finish up here with uh, talking about introverts and extroverts. So I know you might already feel like you know which one you are, but. And I just think about it for a little bit as we, as we talk about these different kinds of communication preferences. Uh, so the introverts tend to get much of their stimulation and energy from their own thoughts, feelings, and moods. So think about this, their own thoughts, feelings, and moods. That's introverted or inside. And then the extroverts are more outside. Uh, they tend to get much of their stimulation and, and energy from external sources, uh, such as social interaction. Uh, so we're, I guess whereas the introvert might, uh, their idea of a good time might be, uh, you know, uh, going to the library and, and spending some quiet hours with a book, and that would be fun for them. Uh, the extrovert might find this painful. Right? They, they would much rather have uh, a small group, a reading group, uh, or they maybe they maybe don't really have patience for books anyway. Uh, they'd rather be talking. And so this is the reason. Uh, why I, th I have problems sometimes with college seminars and you know classes where there's an expectation that you uh, talk a lot in class because I think it's unfair. I think it's biased towards the extroverts, um, and it's unfair. You know, it's, it's it's biased against the introverts, right? So just because you're not comfortable uh, talking a lot in class doesn't mean you're not. Uh, stimulated or that you don't care or that you're not engaged. I mean, quite the opposite. It's just that's, you know, kind of a, a communication preference. And I'm not even really sure. I mean, you can certainly take steps to uh, move from uh, one to the other. Once you become more self-aware, I guess, of your 
uh, introverted nature. Now you might be able to, you know, uh, sort of force yourself to be more extroverted, but I mean, in general, I just think it's better when you offer uh, different ways uh, to communicate. Uh, so, exa for example, in my classes, I use a, uh, a Pear Deck system or um, sometimes just have people uh, write answers on pieces of paper instead of saying it in class. And what I find is that it's not that uh, the quiet students are uh, not, not reading or not listening or anything like that. It's just they feel much more comfortable uh, writing it down or typing it out and giving it to me that way uh, than they do raising their hand and speaking up in, in front of the whole class. So, you know, that's just my little uh, rant on that. I tend to agree with this, uh, this material. Uh, the strengths of introverted professionals, uh, asking thoughtful and important questions, right? Because they've put more time, they, they don't feel this urge to speak up every time uh, there's a question session, right? They want to sit there and they might need a little time, but they'll come up with a good question eventually. Uh, listening to the ideas of others, uh, giving people space to innovate, developing insights to deal with uncertain situations. Uh, so it's, there's lots of these, and I think these are all, uh, you know, I can certainly relate to this. You know, I consider myself very introverted as a professional, and I guess sometimes people will ask me, well, if that's true, then how can you do all these videos? And how can you have that YouTube channel and all of this stuff? And if, if you didn't know this, I have a, a fairly successful YouTube, popular uh, YouTube channel. Uh, but I, I always go back to what Johnny Carson I had to say about this, and he, he was, of course, the uh, the host of the, the Late Show uh, for many, 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 many years. I mean, I'm, I'm fairly sure you know who Johnny Carson is, even if he was before your time. Uh, but he said he was a very introverted personality as well. And you think, come on, you know, this guy's like world famous celebrity. He, he makes his living doing interviews with famous people. And he's always so cool and collected up there. He seems to be so relaxed. But, but he said, no, that's all just kind of a, a training, right? Because what he, he said, we'd said that, uh, you know, he knows what he's getting into. He knows who he's going to interview. So he prepared, uh, you know, he did a lot of preparation. And that was a very controlled environment. You know, being in that uh, talk show host, he had a lot of control over that conversation. There was, it was almost, uh, you know, a formula uh, to those those shows and those, um, uh, you know, interviews. And so he kind of knew what to expect. And so basically it was uh, quite a different scenario than just, say, being at a, one of the things I fear the most is being at a, at a conference. I'm fine giving my paper. Uh, the problem is the, you know, the hallway <laughs> conversations or the, going out to lunch uh, with all these people that I don't really know and, and feeling like I somehow need to be uh, spontaneous and charismatic in, in <laughs> conversations with them, uh, even though I've had no way to really to prepare anything and they might ask questions I haven't really thought about. And for me, that makes me really anxious. I don't like <laughs> my least comfortable uh, situation. Uh, so it's definitely not a matter of just saying, well, if you're introverted, then you, you hate public speaking. I don't think that's accurate. I think that you could enjoy, it's not the public speaking necessarily, it's the, the lack of preparation, the lack of control. Uh, that's the problem. But anyway, let's look here at these strengths of uh, extroverted professionals. Uh, so they have uh, no problem stating views directly, charismatically. Uh, they're good at rallying support. You know, these are the people that everybody else in the office knows well, right? Uh, they're good at organizing people. They inspire confidence. You know, this is a big one. Uh, they can drive uh, conversations. They're good at networking and making strong first impressions that often lead to future partnerships. Uh, so you can see here, they have a lot of advantages. And uh, of course, some disadvantages. I don't want to <laughs> go on forever about that, but <laughs> I remember one of my students, uh, it was fairly successful in business community. He got a job in business communication, working in a sales office. And he told me that, uh, you know, all the successful sales people that were there were, when he arrived, were great phone people. You know, they did most of their work on the phone. They would call up customer clients and customers and they were great at that. They could close the sale. Uh, but what was happening, they were kind of caught, uh, in a bad situation when everyone started to prefer texting and email. 
So a lot of these people they would call up and chat with were now, a lot of these companies were now saying, we prefer to interact online. You know, we prefer text, we prefer email, <laughs> please don't call me. <laughs> and so that really, uh, so the, uh, this new guy, uh, the new salesperson that was more comfortable working online, working with email, he uh, had like a disproportionate number of sales. And it was just because that was his, you know, I guess he was a little more uh, introverted that way. Uh, like being able to plan out what he was going to say and, and write it in email and edit it and all that. Uh, whereas these other folks were a lot more off the cuff. All right, but anyway, let's uh, finish up here. Uh, incivility, I think I said, said that about 60 times now, but <laughs> honestly, I think we're just about done. <laughs> uh, so incivility in society and the workplace. Uh, so they're saying that, let's see, what's the study say? Uh, where was the study done? About 30% as the cumulative study. Let's see, I don't think I have in my notes here uh, where the study came from. Uh, anyway, I guess it's in the book. Uh, but let's see what it says. Uh, so nearly four in 10 respondents, 39%, said they, have, said they have colleagues who are rude or disrespectful. So that's, uh, that's, that's a pretty alarming <laughs> percentage. Uh, more than three in 10, 31%, said that their workplace supervisors are rude. About 30% of respondents said they often experience rudeness at the workplace. And then 38% said they sometimes experience rudeness at the workplace. So it seems like they're saying it's a pretty good chance <laughs> you feel like you've been uh, treated rudely or disrespected uh, in a workplace. Now, the employees who were targets of this rudeness or incivility, they, they tended to respond in these ways. Uh, so half lose work time worrying about future interactions with the instigators of the incivility. Sure. Uh, so if you know if you know somebody's rude, you don't like somebody, uh, you can really spend a lot of time worrying about. It. I mean, I know this from certainly from experience. Uh, you know, most professors and most of my colleagues are very friendly, very nice. You know, never a <laughs> crossword. Uh, then again, some of them will just really. Uh, you feel like it's going to come to blows sometimes. They're just so rude to you. And you really see, I can, if you, if you know you have a meeting with this person, uh, you might encounter them in the hallway. You might even be trying to make uh, thinking of strategies like, how can I avoid this person? Can I structure my office hours in such a way as I don't have to be on campus with this person? Uh, but generally, it's just a, it's a loss of work time. You know, it's not just a personal thing at this point, right? It's something that's impacting uh, the university. You know, some, something needs to be done. Uh, half contemplate changing jobs, and I've certainly known uh, plenty of colleagues who, if they feel like uh, they're in a hostile work environment, uh, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll put in applications. They'll be trying to change uh, their job. Uh, one fourth intentionally cut back work efforts. So even if they don't quit, or they don't, uh, I call this kind of more of a passive, uh, aggressive approach, right? You just won't put in 100% anymore. Right, you'll you'll <laughs> you'll show up as late as possible. You'll do as little work as possible. Uh, approximately 70% tell friends, family, and colleagues about their dissatisfaction, and about one in eight leave their jobs. Uh, common types of incivility in the workplace. Uh, so ignoring others. Uh, this seems to be one of the most common. Uh, people like to, uh, <laughs> you know, if, you, if I pass by a colleague in the hall, I should, you know, I, I'm sure everybody expects a hi, you know. <laughs> hi, Matt. Hey, how's it going? And if I just pass by and not make eye contact, they'll uh, actually think that uh, something must have happened. Uh, treating others without courtesy, uh, disrespecting the efforts of others. And this one's happened to me quite often. Uh, you know, one of the things that just drives me crazy is when an administrator type will come to me and, and ask for uh, my thoughts on an issue you know, maybe they're deciding whether to purchase a new computer lab or software, you know, whatever it is. It seems like they want me to uh, invest a lot of time into researching it and writing it up. So I'll do all that, and then they'll just, uh, and I feel like they don't even read it, or they just <laughs> pass over it, don't mention it. <laughs> and then I, or they, uh, or when they're making their decision, they don't uh, acknowledge uh, my input at all. It just, to me, really comes across as a disrespect, and I get really angry. Like, why did you make me waste all that time and effort. You know, who knows what it is, right? It might not be intentionally intentional, uh, but a good administrator would be aware of that 
and uh, you know make a point of even if they disagree, you know, really show they respect that effort. You know that's the key. They don't have to agree, just respect the effort you put into it. And I know I'm not the only one that <laughs> has had that problem. Uh, disrespecting the privacy of others, right? So somebody tells you something in confidence and then you go blurt it uh, to everybody else or anyone else. This could be, uh, this can cost you a, <laughs> a friendship if not your job. Uh, you know, basically, don't. I always just say, don't say anything to somebody about somebody you wouldn't say to their face. Uh, disrespecting the dignity and worth of others. You know, so this is the huge one. You know, again, this is uh, not just uh, being nice. You know, this is just <laughs> you can actually lose your job over this, and really, you should. You know, if you every person, you know, no person is less of a person than, than anybody else, and you. Uh, you, sh you shouldn't imply otherwise. All right, maintaining uh, civil communications. Um, slow down and be present in life. <laughs> yeah, again, you know, put down the phone, for God's sake. Uh, give people, uh, you know, if you're having a conversation, then treat that with value, you know, value that interaction. Now, listen to the voice of empathy. You know, try to feel what the other person's feeling. Try to look at it from their point of view. Uh, being positive, yeah, you know, everybody has a bad day. You know, we're not saying you have to be uh, constantly smiling, <laughs> uh, you know, constantly cheerful, but, you know, it's, it really does help if you, uh, you know, don't dwell on negativity. Uh, usually when I wake up in the morning, if I'm feeling a little down about something, I think about uh, show tunes or... Uh, uh, there, there's an old cartoon that used to come on the Disney Channel <laughs> way back in the day. And it's like, it's going to be a great morning. It's going to be a great day. <laughs> you probably wouldn't want to be around to hear me singing that, but, you know, it, it, it does kind of uplift my attitude, kind of gets my head out of a uh, you-know-where. and uh, You know, it's never all that bad. <clears throat> uh, for respecting others and granting them plenty of validation. You know, so people are... People will like you a lot better if you take them seriously, if you show them respect. You know, it's not just about being uh, liked or being popular. This is about, you know, a lot of times, about getting the job done, being effective at, at whatever it is you do. Uh, disagree graciously and refrain from arguing. Right, so you're, you, there are definitely going to be times when you have to disagree with people. That's fine. It's not like we have to always be in agreement. That's not the point. The point is being able to disagree with somebody without at the same time disrespecting them or uh, un un needlessly escalating an argument. Uh, six, getting to know people around you. <laughs> you know, this is huge. And it's, uh, you know, some people are introverted people, right? And they don't, they, it's not easy for them to come up to you and shake your hand and introduce themselves. And so sometimes you have to take on a little bit of that responsibility yourself. Yeah, it can be intimidating, especially if you are also uh, an introverted person. But you know, you have to put all that aside sometimes. And yeah, if, if somebody's got an office next to you and you don't even know their name, you know, uh, you could blame that person and be negative about it and pessimistic about it. But you might also be uh, proactive, right, and <laughs> try, to, try to make a little effort yourself. Uh, let's see, paying attention to these small things, right? Uh, ask, don't tell. <laughs> yeah, so don't tell people how they should feel. And uh, don't uh, feel like you have to always give advice. All right, so the chapter takeaways. And again, I apologize, this has gone on for so long. This uh, author really likes his uh, PowerPoints on the lengthy side. Uh, but I think we've, got, we've covered some really great information here. Hopefully you agree. Uh, but anyway, well, let's uh, recap here. So communication process and barriers to communication. Uh, we talked about encoding, decoding, noise. We talked about emotional intelligence and emotional hijacking, uh, self-awareness and self-management. We talked about empathy, which involves active listening, some barriers to that listening, uh, different kinds of questions you can ask, how you can avoid some traps of empathy, and then uh, some stuff about nonverbal communication. Uh, and then we talked about relationship management. So being aware that people don't always like to communicate the same way. Uh, if you're an extroverted person, you know, don't assume everybody else is that way. Uh, some people are introverted, you know, vice versa. 
Uh, think about the impact that has. And then the maintaining uh, civil communication. So it's not just don't be rude. It's uh, about all of these things, right? I think that this fourth one is impossible if you're not aware of these other ones, right? Because if you don't have empathy, for example, then you can't maintain civil communication because you won't be aware that what you're saying is, might be disrespectful. You won't know why. I mean, these are the folks that are always going around saying, I don't know why uh, this, you know, this person was offended by that. Uh, I have no clue. Well, maybe you should get a clue. <laughs> you know, practice some of these uh, techniques, and I think you'll find uh, that this last one will uh, usually take care of itself. All right, so that'll do it for this lecture. Uh, again, please let me know if you have any questions, comments, observations, uh, whatever it is. I would love to hear from you, and uh, I'll see you next time.